Creativity is important for me because it's freedom, you know? It really allows me to think outside the box and create things that people haven't created before. And we're so fortunate that we live in a day and age when we have all this technology that he can use. The things that he has available to work with now wouldn't have been available 20 years ago. I've known uh, Spencer since I was like three years old. Grew up right down the street, literally across the street. I would like run over here, we'd hang out and stuff. As long as they've had games out, we've been playing. I mean, we didn't stop playing Halo until like forever. <laughs> it was great. I think that's what got me into it the most, social aspect of it. I didn't think about gaming till the adaptive controller came out, but once it became available, then it was you know, always on my mind. <laughs> there was an ad that came out and he saw it and it was right before Christmas, so we got him the controller for Christmas. I got the device not knowing, because I'm not a gamer. I, I don't know what any of the buttons do. And I got that thinking, okay, well, here it is. There was a lot of things to work out. When I originally saw the uh, one-handed joystick on Microsoft's website, I didn't think it was gonna work for me because there was no attachments um, that my hand could use. And nothing that was really sensitive enough to play the games that I wanted to, and like Halo and games that require a lot of movement and a lot of button use. When I saw that there are parts out there that work for the that controller, that's when I was finally like, okay, this is pretty cool. I can build on this. I already had the shape in mind, the U shape uh, that I needed to in mind with, uh, with metal ones at first, and they were just too heavy. It led me to, well, 3D printing is probably the best way for me to solve that problem. This is my first um, cutout of the tray tried to model as much as I could after the original controller. Then it just led me to step-by-step step switching little things here and there to finally getting to the point that it was working for me. I've probably made at least 15 different iterations of the joystick itself. You know, just the joy of playing games again really kept me going. After seeing it actually cut out with the design on it, I was like, so many other people can use this besides just Spencer. And I was like, we gotta play some games, man. This is something that we can do together again. And so it's, it's been really nice. I just love seeing him being able to do fun things with his friends and you know, all together again, just like they were before. I'm not done with it. Yet, by any means, but once, you know, everyone that wants the game again can, then I'll know I'm done. Amazing to have Spencer here in the audience. That's just incredible. I mean, I think it's fair to say the adaptive controller has really changed gaming for not just Spencer, but you know, hundreds of, you know, thousands of uh, people out there who want to uh, play video games. And that's why this panel itself is so important because it is all about gaming for all. But specifically today, we're going to be looking at diverse perspectives uh, within that sort of genre. And uh, you know, from mental health to a transgender protagonist, we have an awful lot to discuss today. So we've got a, a very eclectic panel with us today. I'm going to work my way down the line. We have uh, Don Matthews from uh, Ninja Theory. You're welcome. Uh, we have uh, Florent Guillemont from uh, Don't Not. And we have Shannon Loftus from uh, World's Edge and Gina Jackson from Safe in Our World. So first of all, welcome. How are we all doing today? Yeah, really good. Okay. Well, it's it's really, really lovely to have um, so many kind of different perspectives and different parts of the gaming world uh, here today. But um, I suppose we should start off actually talking a little bit about Hellblade, uh, Senua and Sacrifice, because I think 
uh, for a lot of people, um, it was perhaps one of the first games that really shone a light on uh, mental health and what that kind of experience is like. And uh, I know personally, you know, people who haven't experienced mental health, it was a real eye opener of what it is actually like to, to live your life with it. So, um, I mean, tell us sort of a little bit how, um, you know, why are these kind of perspectives so important when we play? Uh, I, I think... Uh... I think games offer a unique medium to explore um, someone else's world, someone else's experiences, and someone else's uh, life. And kind of in, in Hellblade, we wanted to make uh, a compelling game first and foremost. But I think when we started to work with other people within the mental health community, they started to get really excited about how a game like Hellblade can put you in the shoes of someone else. So you can make decisions like that character and experience and discover the world like that person, uh, which is different from, from film and different from literature where you're essentially a spectator. But with games, um, you can take people on deeper, more meaningful journeys. Well, because all of a sudden you're just, you're not, you're not, obviously you're not passive. It'd be a rubbish game if it was completely passive and it wouldn't yeah. really be a game. But, um, you know, it's uh, being thrown, you know, especially with Hellblade, being thrown into the mind of somebody. That's an incredibly powerful thing to do because you have no choice. You're in this situation, whether you like it or not, which is the, the trappings of having mental yeah, health issues. Yeah, and, and it's, uh, uh, you know, we put a lot of work into making sure that we understood what it's like to experience psychosis. Um, to hear voices and to see visions and to have uh, unique beliefs about the world uh, around you um, and worked very hard to make sure that we could replicate that in a way that was uh, gave kind of a taste of what those those experiences might be like um, and I think it was important for us as well that we were telling the story of a, of a Celtic warrior uh, who was on a, a journey to to rescue the soul of her her lover um, but it also happened to be the story of someone who experienced psychosis and severe mental illness. I mean, uh, I'm going to move over to uh, Fl Florent here just, just for a moment. I mean, why, why do you think it's so important now more than ever that we are kind of seeing these different uh, perspectives and g giving these opportunities to uh, see the world through different eyes? Are there stories we haven't heard before? So, uh, we just announced Tell Me Why yesterday. Tell Me Why is the new, brand new game from Don't Nod. Uh, it's it tells the story of Tyler and Alison Ronan, two twins. Uh, and we are here today to talk about Tyler, uh, one of the main protagonists in the game. Uh, Tyler is a transgender man. Uh, and for us, that's uh, an awesome opportunity, an incredible opportunity to be, to be able to represent uh, a transgender character as the lead character in a video game. Um, that was not initially the, uh, the story that we started with. We, we wanted at first to start to tell the story of two twins, two really connected individuals, you know, uh, two identical uh, people, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and as we developed the story, we, we went with this uh, great idea that we love uh, to create contrast and bring, uh, create a great character with Tyler. Um, and as we developed the, the, the character, as we went into that, uh, that field, uh, we thought that was a very inclusive story, uh, a very inclusive character that we wanted to share with our players. So that's why we settled with this idea. And we were extremely lucky to be uh, able to do that uh, and support it by, uh, by Microsoft uh, in, in that process. So we had a great partnership with them. And we are ex extremely happy to be here today and to be presenting the game. I mean, Shannon, you've been around, you know, in the, in the business for, uh, you know, a number of years as, and as a studio head. And um, why, is it, why is it so important now more than ever that we are kind of showing these? And, you know, obviously supporting, you know, studios that want to, uh, you know, tell these different stories and show these different perspectives. Because games more than ever are about the communities that play them. And the more you can create authentic and relatable experiences, the broader set of voices you can bring into your community and the more people you can reach. Phil Spencer gave a speech at DICE a couple of years ago about the capability of games to be the medium that rebuilds the world that we're in now. And we can build the world to a much better image than the one that we live every day. That's very true, that's very true. Um, Gina, you come from uh, Safe in Our World, which is an organization that's got an exciting new, interesting uh, partnership that's uh, gonna be coming up. And we're gonna be looking at that uh, story in a moment. But uh, first of all, just tell us a little bit about the organization itself. So we're a UK-based charity set up by many veterans within the industry who are looking at um, mental health of both the gamers and the people that work in our industry. 
and making sure that we destigmatize it and that we can talk about it more openly. We have great examples of games that can help us discuss those, and particularly when we're targeting such young people, that we need to start, start that debate now. And, and Safe in Our World is uh, creating a destination that people can go to for instant help, and it, that gives you some phone numbers, but also it gives you case stories of games, but people within the industry who are willing to speak out about how they feel. And uh, actually, I, um, I actually have some of my YouTube content on your, um, on your channel itself. I'm, I'm someone who I feel like, you know, social media can be this really, you know, powerful tool for good. But, and, you know, someone could look at my life and what I do and see it very positive. But, you know, when you have depression, there are kind of ebbs and flows of that. And I always kind of felt it was a bit remiss to always project a positive image because that's not life. So I made a, a, little, a little series that you guys have used about how to beat um, depression. Um, but I just feel like it's... it's you know, it's more important than ever now that we are, you know, we have our online gaming communities, but we spend more time alone, it feels like, than, than ever before. So having a platform like yours is just, just so important to kind of get that debate and, and keep that going and, and let people know that, you know, you're not, you're not alone in this, mm. really, out there as well. Um, so obviously, I'm digressing a little bit, but you are partnered to create a rather interesting new game. Should we, I feel like we should just take a look. Should we take a look? That'd be great. My name is Emily and I'm 20 and I made Fractured Minds. I chose to do a puzzle solving format for the game, mostly because it kind of reflects the challenges what you face with mental health issues, like it's a struggle to get the key and to open the door to the next room. And uh, obviously won a Young, Young Game Designers Award at, uh, at uh, BAFTA uh, as well. So, it, and what's the sort of response been like? Uh, the response has been phenomenal. And and particularly with the support of Microsoft has been amazing. But Emily used uh, the BAFTA Young Game Designer as a way of spurring herself on. She created this game in nine months in her spare time after school. Um, and she had a lot of support from people like, um, like Unity and, and Wired Productions to bring this to bear. But she had such a desire to make sure that she could show how she felt um, and to, to see if she could resonate her experiences with other people. Um, and to have a medium like games in which we could do that is something I think we almost have a responsibility to use games in a really powerful way. And, you know, there are so many different perspectives out there. If we think of all the different shades and, you know, like perspectives of minds of people that um, are there and, you know, we're in a great position to do that. Um, I actually would be really interested to know um, for you guys personally, what was perhaps the first game that you played that showed uh, a really different perspective than you were used to seeing? Uh, I, I think for me, it's uh, like I, I, I think it's been the rise of uh, independent games. You know, yeah. has, has, has seen the, the kind of growth in um, diversity and the growth in um, the a array of topics that are being discussed in games now. So, like when I think about that question, I actually think about games like like Firewatch. You know, Firewatch for me is a game that. Um, I think it goes to show that the, the demographic of gamers is broadening and is widening, and it, and it tackles a subject which is, um, you know, maybe someone who is um, 16, it won't resonate as strongly as it will with someone who's older. Um, but it's, you know, it's the story of, um, you know, a husband and a wife and, and their, their, their challenges and her difficulties with health and how he deals with that. Um, and uh, I think to me that really kind of, it resonated with me, but also um, I felt that it was very powerful to be making very important decisions about that character's life through the course of that game. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Florent, uh, what was one of the games that really changed your perspective? Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's really interesting. Uh, I, I mean, uh, Dom said it right. There, there has been so many games, so many great games uh, with the opening of, of independent games, uh, so many diverse experiences. Uh, to me, I, I will talk a little bit about, uh, about a personal story. Oh, sure. Um, and I, I would say the game for me that changed my perspective is, uh, is Life is Strange. Uh, and it's actually the reason why I joined Dontnod. Ah. Uh, because I was working at Ubisoft for a long time uh, before that. 
And when I play Life is Strange, uh, the, the first episode, uh, you get to play through the shoes of, of Max, a, a young uh, student college girl. Uh, and you know, that, that's not my life, that's not me. But I could connect so deeply with this character. Um, and I was so moved by her story uh, that I thought that suddenly, you know, games are not about pushing buttons anymore. It's not about challenges anymore. It's, it's about emotions. It's about living a journey, you know, living through somebody else's uh, perspective. And that really changes the way uh, I wanted to make games. So I joined Don't Done like immediately after, uh, a month after actually. And, and here I am uh, making these games. <laughs> <laughs> well, that really did change your perspective. Shannon, um, what were some of the games for you that really changed the way you look? Um, so I think the first kind of massive perspective switch for me was when I was working on Connect Design and taking into account um, what capabilities people were going to bring into a full body uh, controller. Um, it was, uh, you know, we played a lot with how to use voice for control, how to use gesture, and then how to use full body. And um, we spent a lot of time as a team convincing each other to move away from ABXY thinking. And then maybe a more recent version would be, uh, I played a game called, I think many people did, called Gone Home which is a very, it's an indie game. Um, and uh, it, you start out with the perspective of a gamer approaching what effectively looks like it could be a haunted house. It turns out to be your family's house. And as you explore the home, you learn the story of your family over the past year. Um, but because you're already afraid, it's a dark and stormy night, it's an unfamiliar house. Um, hopefully I'm not spoiling this for anybody. <laughs> if you haven't played the game, you should have played it away. by now. <laughs> Um, one of the key plot points is that your younger sister discovers that she is gay and then she comes out to her parents. Um, and just that fear, the, the visceral fear that you already have being combined with that storyline really made me realize how terrifying that kind of thing can be. Um, when you have to tell your family that you are not who they thought you were. Um, real eye-opener. Yeah, very much so. Tina. So for me, papers please. Oh, demonstrated wow. how quickly yeah. my behavior could change. And, and I was really shocked that simply putting me in an environment, I, I could stop looking for the good in people and just realize how quickly I could reject people. And then my home life, I was very quickly to be corrupted just to save my family. And it was like, wow. That happens so quickly. And I, I like to use those kind of examples, even in a work environment. We're looking at new games. And we often just reject because it doesn't hit the tick list, rather than trying to find a number of idea and grow it out. And I think there's a lot of things we can learn from that kind of thing. Be more positive, just don't look at the, the double negative. How can we get rid of stuff? I mean, even sort of going back to, you know, uh, titles like uh, Fable or, or, or Mass Effect for sort mm -hmm. of me personally, where, you know, you get the opportunity to play as different characters with different kind of sexualities and stuff. And, and I think in some ways it's like, you suddenly realize, oh, okay, so I play as a woman and I keep chatting up women. I wonder what that means. You know, it, it's, it's sort of like quite a safe environment, uh, you know, to actually kind of, you know, experience and pursue and, and play with your sexuality until you find what, who you are exactly as a person, but in a, in a quite safe, in a safe way, you're not actually having to take that out into the real world uh, where other people have other uh, agendas. You know, you can sort of experience that in a safe environment. I think that was probably one of the ones for me. I was like, this is interesting. <laughs> Didn't think about that before. Um, so, um, Florent, obviously, you uh, mentioned obviously this is one of the first times we've seen um, a transgender protagonist. Um, how did this? Um, I mean, sort of, what really kind of inspired developing these kind of like storylines? Yeah, as I said a little bit earlier, when we started the project, uh, we didn't set an agenda. You know, we didn't yeah. have an objective to uh, to represent uh, the trans community. Uh, we didn't uh, set a political goal. You know, uh, but. As we developed this story, uh, and as we came with the realization that uh, it made perfect sense for us, you know, for this character uh, to be a transgender character, and that that created uh, so many themes that we could tell in the game, and that uh, could help the player, the uh, the character progress in the game. Uh, 
that was immediately clear for us that we had to do it. And we didn't want to shy away from doing it because, uh, you know, it's unfortunately today it's a, uh, it's a long road to, to go through uh, to have this kind of character in the game. Uh, so that's why we partnered with GLAD to, to be able to represent this character in a very authentic way, uh, in a respectful way, because we, uh, we have a very, very broad audience at Dontnod. We don't want to, um, uh, to be disrespectful uh, of our players or to, uh, to hurt anybody by doing so. So we engage in this long creation process with this character uh, to make sure that he would be uh, representative and respectful uh, of the trans community. Yeah, and um, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's just incredible when you think about it, how, how much kind of popular culture and entertainment can actually really influence everything greater out there. You'd think that it would be, it would come from some different place, but actually it's kind of books, film and TV and games that kind of actually has such a much bigger impact, really. Yeah. Sorry, that was more of a statement than a, than a question, sorry. Um, so, Dom, obviously with um, Hellblade, uh, w was there a kind of particular, uh, when you went into it, a particular philosophy for kind of doing it? Was it kind of always the intention, like right from the inception to, to go down that route, or was it more kind of, you were sort of, you know, pursuing it, and, and obviously, like with them, um, with Don't Nod, it sort of naturally just came to that point. Yeah, I mean, we um, we decided as a studio that we wanted to make an independent game, um, and we've always made fantasy games. So uh, we decided that we wanted to, to make another fantasy game, um, <clears throat> but one where the fantasy was actually the creation of uh, Senua's mind. Um, and uh, yeah, we never set out to. Uh, create awareness or to educate people about mental health. And back to your kind of previous point, I think that can be where um, there could be a mistake made where people feel that games can educate people. But I think games are so successful at uh, building awareness and surfacing difficult themes um, because they are first and foremost compelling. And that was our aim with Hellblade is we make a great game that people love playing and, and my hope and our hope was that as a byproduct of that, they'll come out the other side of it thinking, oh, maybe I've learned a bit more about what it might be like to experience psychosis. Um, I think if we'd done the opposite and we went out and said, hey, this is a game that's going to educate you about mental health, yeah. I don't think many people would want to play it. And I think, I think that's where games, you know, film and literature could, literature could be really powerful because it's telling a story and as a byproduct, you're coming away with something that's impactful and will stay with you. And it's, it's a, yeah, like you're saying, it's a kind of more sort of, sort of softer approach. And I, and I think you're right, if you had gone with that intention, it would have like reframed how you looked at everything rather than focusing on the story and thereby, you know, something would have been kind of lost. And, and, and like I was saying, as someone who has had depression, it was, it's very, very interesting. Like trying to verbally explain to someone when you are in that kind of deep and that dark moment what it's like. And actually to, if I told people what the voice in my head told me, people would, you'd think that you'd get, you know, sectioned or something because it's, the voice can be so terrifying and so aggressive and so dark. Whereas obviously, you know, you know, putting that within sort of a game context, I can then sort of say to people, well, you know, these are sometimes some of the things that you, that you can hear in your mind. And it's, but knowing that it's depression and it's not, I don't know, like you're sort of terrified of saying these things out loud because they're, they're terrifying to you and you know, and, and you're the person suffering from depression, but to someone who has no understanding of that at all, I could, I could never tell my friends or my family what, what things went on in my head, you know. Yeah, and I think, I think you know, I, I think the stigma is, uh, it, it, it kind of thrives where there is a lack of education around a subject. And I think the more that people learn about a topic like mental health or like depression or about hearing voices, um, the more comfortable and confident people will become in talking about it. And, that, and that's kind of self-propelling. Then other people will be more confident to talk about it. And, um, you know, I, I had the privilege to sit down with people with lived experience of psychosis uh, and to hear their stories. Um, and and I, I remember very clearly thinking, I wish everyone else had this opportunity to hear what it can be like and to take that with them in their, in their life. And, I, and I, I think that's what we have tried to achieve in Hellblade is, um, is that feeling of being very close to a character. And what's been really valuable for, for us as a studio, um, more than anything else, has been the impact that it's had on players. And to hear uh, people say things like you've just said, that uh, the game's given them a language in which they can talk about their own difficulties or a platform that they can talk to their friends and family about 
get them to play the game and say, these are the types of things I experience, um, you know, is, is fantastic that we've been able to do that. I mean, Gina, obviously, um, you know, you've got an awful lot of uh, different content and different stories on uh, Safe in Our World. I mean, have you, um, when you were sort of first kind of, you know, courting that kind of content, do you feel that, you know, people were quite happy to kind of share those stories now? Because I feel like before, no one ever really, no one really talked about it. Everyone kind of kept it to themselves. And that was almost like, it sort of self-perpetuates the problem, you know, and it's the same thing personally. If you don't talk about it, it's the voice just swims around your head. Do you, did you find that people were very happy now to kind of come out and share their experiences? I think we've been really taken aback by the support that we've received. And I think Hellblade really helped yeah, with that. Yeah, definitely. Really yeah. helped with that. Um, but to see how we can continue to take it forward across the whole industry. And, and just to get people, with, even within the workplace, to start talking about how things are impacting them and how they feel, that's really quite hard, particularly in our industry, for people to admit isn't the right word, just to be open. And it should just be an everyday conversation. Yeah. And to be able to share that with people that, that people have heard of, I don't want to use the word celebrity, but just people have heard of, just makes it easier. And you can go somewhere and very quietly, on your own, read about stuff. Or you can play games or play Fractured Minds and, and just be able to have a shared experience. And I think that's what we're trying to say. Don't, nothing has to be done on your own anymore. Um, and if you can open yourself up to more shared experience, then you can help learn about yourself and also about other people. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Shannon, obviously it's been... It's great hearing from, uh, from these guys, obviously, about the kind of support that, that they've been getting as well. I mean, what was kind of the philosophy behind, you know, these, these partnerships? Um, so I've been part of Microsoft's Games for Everyone work in progress, I guess you would call it, <laughs> um, since actually before it existed. And one of the key uh, values that we want to drive into all of our game development is authenticity and relatability with respect to representation of any culture, person, perspective. So if you're going to make a game that includes a Native American, there has to be Native American buy-in, approval, and partnership in order for uh, the, just the, first of all, the character to be believable to Native Americans and non-Native Americans alike. And then um, second, it's, it gives you an opportunity to, um, to benefit the, the group that you're working with. Uh, we had a really good partnership with the Nez Pierce tribe for Killer Instinct, which is a, it's an old example. We continue to have these partnerships. I know you guys are working with the Klingit. Um, but uh, we ended up making a character at the end of the um, season three for Killer Instinct, which our tribal consultant told us was more than just a, a playable character to them. It was a cultural touchstone. Mm. I mean, I think it's just we've got to a point where, you know, there are, there are so many people out there who have the ability to kind of share their stories and say, I think it's, it's the lack of assumption that you, you know, that you could possibly understand what those experiences are like and making sure that you're bringing the right people in. I mean, how important was that for you, uh, Florent? So, for us, you know, as I said, we partnered with GLAD. Yep. Uh, GLAD is the Gay and Lesbian Association Against Defamation. Uh, and for us, that was really key to the process. Uh, because, you know, as much as you uh, educate yourself or uh, research about, uh, for, well, for us, the, the trans identity or, or the trans community, uh, or at large uh, LGBTQ questions, um, you, you get to a certain point where you need more resources, you need to, to talk to people, you need to share their experiences, uh, and even if we have colleagues uh, that are trans uh, in the company or friends uh, in our close uh, environment, uh, we, we couldn't have made this game without them. Uh, they helped us review our scripts, review our character progression, you know, discuss about um, about the, the trans community, what it means to be, uh, to be trans, what what is the, the life of uh, a trans person in, in the society, you know, today. Uh, they even gave us like some history lessons that were really enlightening for us um, uh, about the representativity uh, of trans people in media. Um, so, so that was really, uh, personally, a very interesting process. Um, and it, it really helped us to, to get to this, uh, as Shannon said, to this authentic character that we really love. We, uh, we all love this character at Don't None. We also love his, his twin sister, uh, Alison, that uh, 
we believe we, we got to a point where we created uh, the right character for this game. Um, and I'll just give you a, an, an example because GLAD helped us also to reach out, uh, as Shannon said, to, uh, uh, in terms of representativity, to uh, actors that could embody the character that we were making. Uh, and unfortunately today, you know, in, in our society, uh, there are many great uh, trans actors, many really great and talented actors. We've seen a lot, uh, and they don't have the roles, you know, they deserve just because they are trans. Um, and for us, it was really important to be able to cast an actor that would represent Tyler. Uh, and, and more than that, you know, that an actor that would, uh, that would understand him, understand the character, mm. be able to give him his voice, his acting. And sort of collaborate as well with you and sort of give that feedback as well. Sure, exactly, yeah. And, and he gave us much more than his voice, you know, uh, because he gave his his personality, you know, his, his charism to, to the character. So that, that was an, an excellent partnership for, for us. Uh, we have excellent uh, relationship with August, uh, August Black, the actor who plays Tyler. Um, and also for us, something very important with this particular project was to find an actress that would be his sister, you know, that would play the, the role of Alison. So we worked really hard to create that chemistry, to, to find that chemistry between between the actors, uh, and, and you know we we found two really interesting uh, interesting actors for these characters, who became so much closer than just you know colleagues or actors. They, uh, when we announced the game yesterday, they just tweeted uh, themselves, you know, like oh, he's my brother, and mm -hmm. you know they have a, a really deep connection now because of this work and because mm -hmm. of this game. So, uh, so yeah, that's. That's enlightening yeah. for us. I mean, obviously, you know, having um, a protagonist that's, you know, uh, transitioning, I mean, uh, is a, a huge statement within a game. But what, what do you want gamers to, to take away from experiencing that? Um, so, so Don covered it uh, in a great way the, a bit earlier. I believe that games have this very special ability, you know, this special power in games to, to make you play as someone, you know, we've all been like a Jedi you know, <laughs> in games, or we've, we've been a lot of things in games. Uh, we, we were able, because of games, to, to understand or to live the life of different people from different horizons, from a, a, a big variety of, uh, of horizons. And, you know, I said earlier that it wasn't an objective, an agenda to have a trans character in the game, uh, because we don't want uh, we have a very unique opportunity with this game, you know. We don't want people to believe that it's a commercial argument or we designed it for a market, you know. Uh, but I think with this game we have this opportunity to, to really connect people with the character that, that we are creating and with the story that we are telling. And I think that's the magic be before, uh, with video games. Uh, and if we get players to to connect to our characters, to connect to Tyler in, in this uh, instance, and be able to understand a little bit better, you know, what it means to be a, a trans person in uh, in the society, that would be amazing. Oh. That would be a very positive message. Definitely, um, Gina. Like, is there anything you'd like to sort of share with people at home, and sort of like what you know, what what they can come to you for, like how they can connect with you if they um, if they are suffering from uh, you know mental health issues? I think. Um First of all, connect to us through our website, um, where we have a lot of stories, including your own. But also, if you work in the industry and you want to become more involved, then talk to us, because we, we're a very new charity, but we've got bold ambition. And the more people who we can involve, and from the more diverse backgrounds too, um, the more good, I think, that we can do as a whole industry. So whether it's talking on panels, um, or whether it's getting out and making other games or encouraging people to share their stories. They're all really important things. Um, but if anyone is, um, is worried, then I would say, please, there's numbers on our phone, uh, on our website. Pick up the phone and please talk to someone. Definitely, definitely. And, and Shannon, any sort of like final thoughts you'd like to share uh, from the sort of Microsoft standpoint? Sure. Um, so my friend Katie Joe, who leads the Games for Everyone work at Microsoft, uh, likes to say if you do not deliberately and intentionally include, you will unintentionally exclude. 
And I would take that a step further, and I'm proud of the way the World's Edge team has leaned into this. We uh, take inspiration from the challenge of being authentic and relatable and getting the voices of as many different people into our development process as we can. Um, we find inspiration when people are willing to share their voices and their story with us, and it drives us to, to, to try even harder to, um, to do justice to the, the gift that um, these different communities are giving us. Um, and those are the games, I think, that registers the highest quality experiences for gamers as well. Gamers can smell a fake coming a mile off. So lean into it. <laughs> Any kind of final thoughts from, uh, from you guys you'd like to share with everyone at home about the kind of future of what you're doing or uh, the, the work you've done previously? Yeah, I mean, for us at Ninja Theory, we, um, I think we, we, uh, we've created a game that's told the story of a character that um, experiences uh, mental health difficulties. Um, and through the collaborations on that project uh, with both people with lived experience and people within the neuroscience community, um, we've recently announced a new project called the Insight Project, um, which is taking things uh, one step further. So uh, the idea of that project is that we're exploring how uh, games can not only um, tell the stories of people with mental health difficulties, but can actually uh, go one step further and help treat mental illness. Um, so it's, it's at very early stages, but it's a project where we are essentially trying to understand how we can measure stress levels uh, through biometrics and physiological outputs, um, and then to uh, realize those in a video game experience, and through that game experience, teach players how they can manage and reduce those stress levels. So super exciting project. Um, we're, we're really ambitious with it, and we've just announced it, so um, please go and check it out if you're interested. Definitely, yeah, the URL obviously came up on screen there if, you've got, um, if you want to go and check out what they're doing. And obviously, uh, for, when, can we, um, when can we play? When can we play the game? <laughs> Most importantly, yes. Exactly. <laughs> so, so the game is uh, unfolding over three chapters. Uh, they will all be available in summer 2020. We don't announce dates yet. Uh, oh, but the games will be uh, following a reliable, reliable schedule uh, for everybody to be able to play this summer. Oh, brilliant. Well, could we have a, a huge round of applause for all of our panel uh, for kind of sharing their stories. And uh, just to see us out uh, for this Gaming for Everyone panel, I think we've got a little bit of more about the, uh, the Insight project. We'll see you next time. The Insight project is a rare example of artists, scientists and mental health experts coming together to tackle one of the most pressing challenges of our time, mental suffering. We're asking a question. Could we combine the best of game design and technology with cutting-edge clinical neuroscience and psychiatry to help with mental suffering and to promote mental well-being? This became the Insight Project. We recognise that there's a powerful and widespread movement in science and psychiatry based on acknowledging that the brain and the body are truly intimately related and must be considered as a functioning unit. But game technology gives us a missing piece. It gives us control of the person's environment. This is enormously powerful. But why do we think games could help? Well, over the last decade, the games industry has been in an arms race, developing real-time technologies such as virtual avatars, natural human computer interfaces, data analytic tools, online technologies that are at levels of sophistication that are grossly underestimated by the wider world. And all of these tools were created to engage a captive mass audience, train them in new skills and promote mastery of games. And this is a tool set that we think could equally be applied to mental well-being. What Hellblade had achieved was to make the invisible visible. What if we could go further and give people the ability to see, engage with and perhaps even overcome their fears and anxieties? Over the next few months and years, we will be sharing our approach, publishing our findings and growing our team. The project will grow in complexity as we tackle harder and harder problems for which solutions may not yet exist. However, we do believe that by focusing our efforts on what we can do now and collaborating with those who can offer different or complementary solutions, we can kickstart a movement, one based on sound principles, and help each other to find ways of improving the quality of life for a lot of people.